um, I related the I related the uh, teaching theories and methods that we were learning about to information literacy instruction, um, because that's where that's the context where I had teaching experience. Um, I think that a lot of librarians have limited training for best practices in specifically working um, with English language learners. So I'll talk about ways that we can help English language learners in academic libraries, um, including in information literacy classes and at the reference desk. Um, so from my time in the TESOL program, I realized that techniques that help English language learner students usually benefit all students. Um, so my goal with this presentation is to talk about strategies that are useful to English language learners that you can often use with anyone. Um, so these strategies don't have to be something that you only use with a traditional ENL or ESL class. Um, you would be able to use them in many different situations. Um, also, I just want to note that throughout the presentation, I'm going to refer to English language learners as L's from the abbreviation ELL, -L, um, just because it's easier to say, and I'm going to be saying it a lot. So when I was doing research on L and academic libraries, I found somewhat of a gap in the literature relating to academic libraries and college students who were formerly in a K-12 ENL program. Uh, what I did find information on was academic libraries and, uh, and international students, uh, international students in higher education, K through 12 school libraries in ELLs, K through 12 ENL programs, and public libraries in ELLs. Um, I was mostly interested in ELLs who are former K through 12 ENL students and who are no longer part of a formal ENL program, because I think these are some of the students that I work with at Farmingdale. Um, so to see how I could best meet the needs of um, former ENL students, I applied the methods that I learned from the TESOL program to the context of an academic library. Um, so in this presentation, we'll talk about how um, we'll talk about English language learner statistics, characteristics of L's, and strategies that you can use that are helpful to L's, both in information literacy classes and at the reference desk. So first, I want to get started recognizing the amount of L's that we might be working with, because librarians might not know which of our students are language learners. Um, so the most recent data I found is from 2018 from the National Center for Education Statistics and the New York State Department of Education. Um, across the United States, 10.2% of public school students were enrolled as English language learners. Um, and I also have some data for New York State. And if you happen to be looking at that static slide that I have up, um, you can see it there. So 10.4% of students throughout New York State were multilingual learners. Um, in New York City, 15% um, of students are L's. And outside of the city, um, the top L districts include um, outside of outside of the city in New York State include the downstate region. Um, districts such as Brentwood, Yonkers, East Ramapo, Hempstead, Central Islip, and Westbury. Um, so those are a lot of districts um, in Nassau and Suffolk County where, um, where a lot of Farmingdale students come from. Um, also upstate areas, um, districts in Buffalo, Rochester, Syracuse, and Utica. So those percentages for like the statewide totals could be a little bit higher in those K-12 districts. Um, so I was curious to know the number of students who are L's at Farmingdale. I talked to our Office of Institutional Research, and the SUNY application showed that 12% of our students reported that they spoke a native language other than English in 2020. Um, this number might be a little bit off, though, because this was not a required question on the application. Um, so if students left it blank, it did default to yes, um, that English was their native language. Um, so it's not entirely accurate. Um, those numbers give you an idea of how many students you might work with whose native language is not English. So even though these students might not have a designation of ENL or ESL anymore, um, they might still benefit from certain methods of teaching and communicating that we can implement in libraries. So who are ELLs? I want to talk a bit about the characteristics of ELLs so we can understand how to best work with this group of students. Um, so some of these points might be obvious to you, but I want to start with the basics by pointing out some commonly held misconceptions about L's. Um, so let's just recognize some of these assumptions that people might have. Um, L's can be from all types of backgrounds. So 
different cultures, different races, socioeconomic levels, academic experience, academic experiences. Um, if you had any image of an English language learner in your head, uh, just remember that it could really be anyone. Uh, English ability does not equal intellectual ability. Um, just because someone is learning a new language does not mean they have less intelligence. Um, I think language learners deserve so much credit um, for doing what everyone else is doing, taking on college level coursework, but they also have an extra step of processing English to tackle, which is a big deal. Uh, the next point is that using a native language does not interfere with learning English. So don't stop students from speaking their native language in the classroom. Um, sometimes it can be maybe a little intimidating if your students are speaking um, a different language to each other and maybe you don't know what they're saying or um, you know, feel a little bit uh, weird about that, but it's really important not to tell someone that they can't use their native language. Um, so during class time, if students are working with groups, it can be really helpful for them to speak their native language to each other while they're doing work. Um, and the last assumption that I want to call out is that social English proficiency is not academic English proficiency. Um, so it might only take one to two years to learn social English compared to possibly up to 10 years to learn academic English. Social English includes the skills needed to have a conversation and academic English would include advanced vocabulary, technical language, um, which might even be difficult for native speakers. So this discrepancy might cause L's to possibly appear lazy because it looks like they don't have a language barrier, but they actually might struggle with certain aspects of English. So instead of internally thinking in your mind, like, why don't they get this? Always try to remember that you often don't know a student's background and some students might need extra support, which is totally okay. Um, so next, I would like to talk about L's who are part of generation 1.5. I think these are some of the students who I work with at Farmingdale. They're not considered international students um, or students who are in a formal ENL or ESL program. Uh, Generation 1.5 includes students who have been mostly educated in the US and they're competent in daily communication. However, uh, they can be challenged by academic tasks at the college level. So research shows a gap between the academic language proficiency of L's um, compared to native speakers in regard to their ability to manage first year college reading assignments. There was a 2012 study by authors Rosing and Douglas that compared L's to native speakers by profiling excerpts of assigned first year readings and other coursework. Um, they found that L's are academically competent and have high math scores, but they struggled with English. Um, their reading levels were, were lower than native speakers. And even with strong K-12 language learning support, like an ENL program, uh, many academically competent L's were not able to master academic language acquisition before they graduated high school or before they tested out of that ENL program. Um, so I would like to focus on Generation 1.5 uh, because this topic is relevant to my institution. Um, Farmingdale does not have a traditional ESL program, um, but I do know that many of our students are non-native English speakers. So I'm thinking that this might also be relevant to some of you too. Um, so I'd like to talk about the challenges that are faced by L's. Um, I started to mention how they can have difficulty with academic language. Um, there was a study that I wanna mention that was conducted by Huster in 2012, uh, which interviewed generation 1.5 college students. So I really like the study because students were interviewed in focus groups. You get to really hear what they were experiencing and how they felt. Um, when you look at the literature on generation 1.5 students, they're often described as still being in the process of learning English, even at the college level. So that's what the author was investigating. How students who come from homes where English is not the primary language can go through all their education in English, but are still described as being in the process of learning English. Uh, most of the students in this study were born in the US um, and all of them attended English speaking schools in the US throughout their entire education. So the focus groups in this particular study revealed that most of the students were not satisfied with their English ability, especially for the purposes of writing for college classes and participating in the college classroom. 
um, they felt like they weren't able to communicate as well as their native English speaking classmates because they struggled with grammar and academic vocabulary. Um, so in conversations with students in this study, the author recognized certain themes and how the students communicated. Um, so the student said that they sometimes had trouble answering questions posed by the author because they didn't understand a word in the question. They said that this sometimes happens to them in classroom situations too. Um, even though the students in this study didn't have an accent, they did show certain language pattern alterations related to morphology and syntax. Um, so these are linguistic terms. Uh, morphology refers to the way that words are constructed, um, including roots, prefixes, and suffixes. And syntax relates to the arrangement of words in sentences. So this could result in some surface errors, even though you can usually understand what the person means. Uh, so common errors in this study included misusing past tense or plural forms, especially um, with irregular verbs. So for example, some of the phrases that the students said were, quote, we seeked for a higher education, quote, we were the middle childs, and quote, it hurt it. Um, another common variation that was found were errors with non-count nouns. So basically these are nouns that cannot be counted, like the word education would be an example of a non-count noun. Um, examples that were spoken in this study are, quote, my sister will call me and ask for advices, um, quote, why does your parents want to be missionaries, and quote, they see so many drama instead of so much drama. So the students talked about how the vocabulary impacted them. They felt like they had a limited vocabulary that impacted their writing and their ability to participate effectively in class. Some quotes from students are, quote, I frustrate often at finding the right word. Quote, I don't feel like I have a big enough vocabulary because I guess just hearing other people talk with you, they use a lot of big words. Sometimes when people speak out in classes, like other students or my peers, there's sometimes I don't know what they mean because I never heard the words before. Or like I heard it, but I don't remember the definition or what it actually means, end quote. So the students in this study felt embarrassed and disappointed with their English ability. Even though they were articulate and analytical, uh, their grammar and vocabulary impacted their confidence. Um, also, one of these students noted that she didn't feel limited by her English ability prior to entering college, but then when she tried to participate in, co in college classes, she started to feel awkward and unprepared. Um, so this study showed that generation 1.5 students did have some deviations from standard English. It didn't significantly affect comprehension for anyone listening to them or reading their writing. But these differences can stigmatize the students as non-native or foreign, um, or possibly even uneducated or unintelligent, which we know is not true. Um, so after hearing this, maybe we can take a pause for a minute and think about how the experiences that these students shared can impact how they might use the library. Um, so if you wanna take a minute, just feel free to throw some thoughts in the chat if you're at your computer. Um, think about how might L students' language abilities affect how they use the library. You can consider um, generation 1.5 Ls or maybe Ls that are international students. Um, and maybe think about information literacy classes, conversations at the reference desk, like how they might search databases or communicate with librarians. Um, any thoughts on challenges that might arise? You can feel free to throw that in the chat. So I'll just wait a minute. So we're seeing uh, may interfere in asking questions at the reference desk, resulting in misunderstanding by the reference librarian. Very true. They might be intimidated or scared to ask for help at all. Exactly. Any other last thoughts before we move on? Yeah, search terms can be difficult, definitely. Um, 
they might make their request more simple than what they are truly looking for. Yeah, if, um, if maybe they can't like figure out how to articulate their true research question, they might simplify it a little bit. Um, you could easily skip, like, skip over these students um, in information literacy class, uh, particularly if they don't identify, right? So as a librarian, like, I'm not sure who's a native English speaker or not. It might not always be obvious. Um, so thank you so much for all of those thoughts. Um, um, someone else says, I love my ENL students. They come to me for help with homework um, and things like taking their permit tests because I have time to help um, them with Google. I have time to help them Google unfamiliar words and create study guides, right? If you're not approachable, respectful um, and helpful, students can be intimidated. Absolutely. Um, so personally, after reading that study by Huster, um, one of the first things that I thought about was selecting keywords. Um, so when I help students refine their searches, I tell them to think about other keywords that they can search to try to come up with any alternate words maybe that they first didn't think of in, in order to get better results. Um, but if students are struggling with vocabulary, this can be a real challenge for them. Um, how are they supposed to come up with search terms if academic language um, is a challenge? Um, also think about how using plural forms, synonyms, and correct spelling can be, can be difficult, um, and this can limit their effectiveness in searching. Also, some of the things that were brought up before, hesitation to ask questions in InfoLit classes. Um, it can be really easy to just miss a word and then become lost, and then to ask a question and show the whole class that you don't know something or you missed something, that's kind of a big deal to do that. You have to really put yourself out there. Um, and um, like the students in this study lacked confidence in their speaking. Um, there can also be easy miscommunications. And I have an example of that to talk about in a little while. Um, other challenges include anxiety, like uh, maybe how accents can impact students' communicative success. Um, so they might be a little anxious about that. Um, also, it's important to remember that L's might experience cultural differences. Um, academic libraries can vary by country, and L's who are international students might not be familiar with North American academic libraries. So even if students might know that academic libraries are places to look for information and complete assignments, they might not know how to use them effectively or know that there's help available to them. Um, research shows that some libraries in other countries might not have modern qualities. Um, and they might still have closed stacks, limited online and scholarly sources, and no professionally trained librarians. Um, so there was one study that looked at first year grad students who reported that conducting research for classes in the US was uh, very different from their undergrad research in their home countries. Um, also, some international students didn't realize that the library was free because it wasn't free in their home countries. Um, so compared to native English speaking students, L's tend to have higher library anxiety in communicating with librarians and in using libraries. So how can academic libraries support L's? Um, I'm focused on different ways that we can reinforce content for students and establish rapport with students to support the L community. So we'll talk about some strategies that you can use at the reference desk in info lit classes. And some of these might be things that you already do. I do think it's still helpful to know what specifically benefits L's, so you can just keep that in mind when you're working with students. So before we even get started, um, it's helpful to acknowledge and to try to reduce any anxiety that students might be feeling about using the library or about doing research. You can reassure students that you're there to help them and try to make them feel comfortable asking questions at the library. Um, the first technique um, we'll talk about is your rate of speech. So you should speak naturally, but remember to speak clearly. Uh, research shows that slowing down speech in terms of individual words or sentences actually might not be useful for language learners, um, but it is good to pause between different groups of ideas and to restate your ideas to help learner comprehension. Um, also try to avoid using library jargon and avoid slang and idiomatic expressions. Um, so I looked up some examples of idioms, um, and I found some that I might be able to find myself using when helping students, like, so far, so good, we'll cross that bridge when we come to it, or your guess is as good as mine. Um, so even during this presentation, I almost said the phrase, 
to make sure we're all on the same page. And then I realized that, that is the kind of thing that I am supposed to avoid. Um, so the next strategy um, is providing wait time in classes. So make sure you give your students enough time to form their responses when you ask a question in class. Students might be thinking and producing in two or more languages and they need time to process. So don't call on someone immediately, um, give them enough time to wait um, give them enough wait time so they feel comfortable answering. Um, I know sometimes we're just hoping that someone will raise their hand and answer our questions, um, but it really is good to wait um, to make sure that everyone is thinking and not everyone feels comfortable like immediately volunteering. Um, so you can also use like an online poll or any kind of platform where students can anonymous, anonymously share their thoughts. Um, an anonymous way for students to ask and answer questions really takes pressure off of them. Um, and so they don't have to worry about putting themselves out there. They can really just focus on getting the information they need. Um, and it doesn't matter to me who is asking the questions. I just want to make sure that everyone knows what's going on. Um, and personally, even as a native English speaker myself, I was a shy undergrad. And by the time I was ready to talk in class, usually the class started moving on already. So I think this will benefit everyone too. Um, so the next part that I would like to mention is language. So it's important to be aware of how language and culture can intertwine. Uh, sometimes there are misunderstandings because of different communication styles. Um, so one study on this topic um, showed focus groups where um, several Chinese students said that they were confused by the phrase check out books on a sign in the library. Um, the group of students thought that check out meant examining or searching. They were not interested in being examined or searched. Um, another group of students thought that checking out books was associated with paying for books. So in this case, the library changed the sign to borrow books. That is um, one example of how there can be miscommunication so easily between non-native and native speakers. Um, also in terms of nonverbal communication, Keep in mind that different cultures have different views of facial expressions, physical gestures, posture, eye contact, voice pitch, or volume. Um, American students usually use eye contact in one-on-one -on -one conversations, um, which typically indicates interest or respect. Um, but students from other cultures might look away in conversations. Um, it's possible that could be perceived as not paying attention. Um, keep in mind that space can be different in different cultures too. Uh, one example that I found was that Middle Eastern students tend to be um, physically closer to the people that they're speaking to, um, which is a sign of respect for others. Even posture can be a type of body language. Um, and I also um, found a study that said Chinese students might relate correct posture with respect, sitting with one leg crossed over the other leg might be viewed as offensive by some. Um, so that is all something to consider how there might be different interpretations of body language. So next, I would like to talk about using non-linguistic cues, uh, visuals, gestures, intonation, and um, other non-verbal cues can make language and content more accessible to students. Teaching with visual representations of concepts can be really helpful for L's. So any visual that you can provide of what is being discussed is beneficial. Um, examples might include images of different types of sources, like if you're explaining a peer-reviewed article, show the peer-reviewed article. Um, if you're giving an intro to the library, have photos. Um, if you're talking about the reference list, show an image of that, all things like that. Uh, short videos can also be really helpful in providing videos. Um, and even if someone has mastered social English, it can be more difficult to absorb the content in an info lit class, which might include new new terms, new concepts. So these visuals always help. Um, one scaffolding tool that you can use to help L's um, are graphic organizers. Graphic organizers are a visual guide that students can use to plan and organize their ideas. So there are different types of graphic organizers. Um, one example of how they can be used is with concepts like citing sources. Um, you can create a chart that lists the different elements of a citation, like author, title of source, date, and so on. Um, and then students will identify what those different elements are, um, and then they can use that chart to construct the citation. Um, I observed in high school in the TESOL program, and they used graphic organizers for everything. 
Um, so breaking up a process like citing sources into a few steps can be so helpful and it's particularly useful for L's, but it can really also help everyone. Um, another type of graphic organizer is a KWL chart. Uh, this stands for what you know, what do you want to know, and what you learned. The K section, what students know, helps them activate their background knowledge and make connections to class content. Um, so you can ask them what they already know about the content that you plan to teach that day, like maybe searching databases. Um, so this helps prep them for what is going to be taught. The W section, what they want to know, helps them engage in a new topic. Um, and it can also help you as an instructor learn about their prior knowledge. Um, so depending on the class, you can have students submit these responses in a form, quickly review them before you start teaching so you know students' background, um, particularly, particularly in a one-shot infolit class, that could be helpful. Um, and then that last section of the KWL chart, uh, what they learned, um, that can be filled out at, at the end of class and used as a short-term assessment tool. Um, and then depending on your class, you can also um, create a master list with your students as a group to display what everyone learned. So the next technique I'll mention is modeling and thinking aloud. Um, when you're explaining how to do something like searching databases or citing sources, it's really helpful to explain your process step by step. So whether you're teaching a class or helping someone at the reference desk, um, it's, it can be so easy when you get used to doing something like opening the library website, searching databases, that sometimes you can forget that it can be completely new to someone. Um, so for example, if someone comes to the reference desk, asks for articles on climate change, um, you're not going to just give them an article um, and not show them what you're doing. Um, you'll use modeling and think aloud to explain exactly what you're doing as you're doing it. Um, so it can be easy to forget your entire thought process to explain that. Um, and you can be really granular. Just mention why you're taking each action as you're doing it, as you're navigating through the search process. This might feel redundant, um, but sharing your thinking processes, uh, it's really helpful to else. And I always make sure that students can see the computer monitor um, so they can see how I'm searching as I'm explaining it. Um, also, showing any models of finished products is really helpful for ELVES, like any example citations, maybe a sample paper formatted in a certain citation style, an annotated bibliography. It's a lot more difficult for ELVES if you tell them what to do. It's so much better if you show them. So the next part that I'd like to mention is cooperative learning um, or group work. So that's another strategy that really benefits English language learners. Um, Group work is just known to give stu students and L students a low stress and friendly learning environment. Group work allows for thinking time. Uh, students are more likely to say what they're thinking in a small group compared to the entire class. They can brainstorm, they can try out new ideas in this like lower stakes setting. Um, and it's just such an easy way for students to ask questions to each other and explain things to each other. So you can break students into small groups or even do a think pair share. Um, which is where you ask the students to um, think about an answer themselves, then just turn to the person next to them, um, chat about their responses. And then as the instructor, you can, you can call on a few groups to share what they talked about. Um, so I saw these strategies um, in almost every single ENL class that I observed. And I think it's really very possible to apply them to information literacy classes, you might already be doing these, but again, these are just known strategies that help ELs and they help everyone too. So the next, um, the next part is about creating resources for your learners. Um, written instructions are really helpful for ELs. ELs might have difficulty understanding every single word um, and depending on the class, they might uh, be trying to follow along on their own computer maybe learning new library related terms. It can be difficult to keep track of everything. A handout can be um, just a good point of reference to refer back to. Um, in the past, depending on the class, I felt like handouts weren't always necessary because I thought these are college students, they can take their own notes. But now I realize that if it helps students, I am very happy to provide a handout. Um, so it's easier to remember what was covered in class. Students don't have to write down as much information. They have more time to process the information. 
Um, and then you can include like examples, like successful end products, like we talked about um, in that modeling section. Um, so if students are writing APA papers, um, give them an excerpt of a sample paper so they can see how it's formatted. Um, and if you, use, if you use an electronic handout, like if you share a Google Doc with them, um, it's just so easy to link to resources. You can link to the slides that you're using, a libguide, databases, videos, everything. Uh, I also created some short videos on different topics like citing sources, choosing keywords, and navigating databases. Um, and I sometimes show these in class too. I show students where to access them on the library website so they can refer back to them on their own. Um, and in remote classes, I just put those links in the chat so they have really easy access. All right, so I'll just recap some of these strategies that we just talked about. Um, I found many of them mentioned um, in a librarian's self-assessment of how they teach international students. Um, so this was a 2014 study. Um, these are librarians that, um, that work with L students. So these are the strategies that they use, um, starting with the most frequently used. They said that they adjusted their speaking style. Um, they uh, repeated and rephrased words. Um, they paid attention to students' reactions to their explanations to see if they were understanding. Um, they consciously showed empathy, understanding, and interest in students' questions and responses. They used active listening techniques. They were aware of their speaking speed when interacting with students. They followed up to check on students' understanding. They avoided technical and library specific jargon. They used prepared handouts. Um, they used written communication, like writing down key points. And they acknowledged that different cultural norms exist for different library systems and services. Um, so you might already incorporate these methods into your teaching or into how you work with anyone in libraries, but I thought it was interesting to see what librarians who work with international students thought was most important. So next, I have a few more methods that are commonly used in ENL classes that could also be helpful in InfoLit classes. Um, so flipped classroom. Because L students benefit from having a preview of the class content, Flipped classroom lessons can be really helpful if you can coordinate it with the teaching faculty that you're working with. Um, students can review the resources before class, um, maybe post it as an assignment through their course's LMS page. Um, so resources can include videos, handouts, maybe a libguide. So the classwork would be used to do um, like the harder work of assimilating those resources. So they'll have more time to search databases. Um, and do whatever project they're working on. Um, so multiple exposures to content is very helpful for L's. Uh, so this would be one way to do that. So if you do teach a traditional ENL class where everyone is a non-native English speaker, it could be helpful to provide the instructor with some vocabulary that you're going to cover ahead of the class. Um, but this can also be difficult, especially for one-shot InfoLit sessions. So I know that you do need that buy-in from the instructor and you need some collaboration time to plan ahead in order to have students actually view the materials prior to class. Okay, so language objectives. Um, when you think about a typical ENL class, it is also helpful to have language objectives as part of the lesson. So this is one way to give learners equal access to the curriculum, um, even if they might not be fully English proficient. So establishing language objectives means that you outline the academic language that's, that will be learned and mastered in that lesson. So this is important for regular ENL classes. I do think it could also be adapted for information literacy classes. And I think we already do this to some extent. Um, language objectives for an InfoLit class um, could include explaining vocabulary like, um, like abstract, plagiarism, peer reviewed article, all those words that we might find ourselves explaining, but I know that I didn't think of them as language objectives before. Um, another strategy that ENL classes use a lot are word walls. Um, so this helps L's with their vocabulary skills. It's basically a spot on the classroom, on the classroom wall, or maybe a whiteboard where relevant vocabulary is listed, maybe with a picture or maybe with a brief definition. So you could create a word wall while teaching 
and it would help L see the vocabulary um, listed. Um, so it, this depends on the needs of your class. So this won't be applicable for every class, um, but pre-teaching and vocabulary front-loading is really helpful for L's. Um, so creating a word wall or um, a word wall to introduce vocabulary before you use it in context could be a good strategy, um, particularly if you have um, a more traditional e &L class in an information literacy session. Um, one more strategy for a traditional e &L class would be story reenactment. Um, this is where students act out stories as part of the learning process. So one example of this is a lesson on plagiarism. Students can be assigned different roles. Um, for example, someone who is copying and pasting into their paper, um, maybe someone else who is quoting information in their paper without using quotation marks and so on. Um, these strategies can help reinforce the content and really make it like a memorable learning experience to explain what plagiarism really is. Um, but again, this all depends on the needs of your class. And it's also important to check students' understanding. Um, L's in particular might be hesitant to ask questions. Um, so one example I found is that some international students from certain countries are sensitive about saving face. Um, so they might say that they understand even if they don't, and students don't want to lose face by saying that they don't understand because they that might reflect poorly on the instructor in their view. Um, but uh, this isn't true for all L's, um, but it is helpful for librarians to be aware of, of these differences. Um, so don't wait until the end of the class to ask if students have questions, try to check in with them, see if they need any clarification. Um, in my own classes, when I taught in person, I always like to give them an opportunity to discuss individually. And I feel like students are always more comfortable talking to me one on one uh, when I'm going around the room, and then they'll ask me all their questions. But that was pre COVID. But I think that um, anonymous polling can also be like a really good way to gauge students understanding. Um, and if students are anonymous, again, um, it just takes the pressure off. Um, so they're not like they wouldn't be worried about standing out um, as someone maybe who doesn't get it. Um, I know no one wants to feel like they're asking a stupid question or being judged and being anonymous just really gives you that freedom. And for myself, I'm not grading these students. So it doesn't matter to me who doesn't understand something in the first try. Um, I would just love if everyone was honest and just um, could just tell me like what they were feeling so we can go over and make sure everyone gets it. Okay, so that wraps up most of the formal strategies um, to support L's in info lit classes and at the reference desk. Um, but before we wrap up, um, I also want to mention some informal things that we can do to build rapport with L students. And I really think we are already doing many of these. Um, so in one study, ESL students were surveyed about their ideal learning environment. ESL students responded that they wanted their teachers to have enthusiasm, patience, a warm reception, and personalized acceptance and concern for each student. So I think these are characteristics of a typical ENL classroom where many L's feel comfortable, but they would also like these qualities to be replicated in other learning contexts too. So just small things like having a welcoming smile, introducing yourself, um, trying to just acknowledge and address um, students' concerns. Um, it can really make a big deal in making L's feel comfortable. Um, and I think it's important to make sure that L's and all students see the library as a helpful place where they can get support. Um, I think it can be difficult feeling confident approaching the reference desk or asking for help, uh, especially if you're not sure how to phrase a question or you feel like you're going to be judged for not knowing something. So I know this is obvious, but just having a friendly face can go a long way in building rapport with students. And I think it's important to emphasize that it's okay if someone doesn't know something. That is why you're there. You're there to help them. Um, and internally, in our minds, if we're ever surprised that um, you know someone might not know something, um, it's important to remember that you don't necessarily know someone's background just because their conversational English is great. Um, academic English might be different for them. Um, and I think once students know where to get help 
and, um, and that they feel comfortable getting that help, it plays a big role in helping them succeed in college. Um, and lastly, like I know not all of these students, uh, not all of these strategies can be applied to all situations, but um, keeping, keeping these in mind when working with students can be useful. Um, students will be doing research and using the library throughout their college careers. Um, so if you use these methods that benefit ELLs, um, you can really help all students um, learn to conduct research and you can help in their transition to college. Um, so that wraps it up for me. Um, I'm wondering if there are any questions. I don't know if you can, there's nothing in the Q&A right now. Um, you can scan back through the chat. I think you got a lot of comments. Um, but yeah, we should always, as always, if people have questions, if you wanna, sometimes we snowball once one question gets started, but please feel free to put them in the Q&A if you have them. I know perhaps people are, oh, here's one. Uh, do you see that one? From- I do. Um, How willing are the professors uh, to use your knowledge? Um, the teaching faculty, um, maybe you mean? Um, I, I think that, I'm actually not so sure what you mean, but, um, <laughs> within classrooms. I mean, when I teach uh, information literacy sessions, I feel like a lot of these strategies um, can be implemented without much intervention by the teaching faculty. Um, for, for my classes that I teach in the library, except um, the flipped classroom, which you would need participation um, with that teaching faculty member. Um, so I actually tried to reach out to some of our teaching faculty about the flipped classroom lessons because I had these brief videos that I was interested in students viewing prior to class. Um, we do collaborate with one group that does that, but with others, um, I felt uh, I did not get a lot of um, collaboration interest with that. Um, so for the students that they have the um, English language learner students in, um, well, I think part of this is that uh, sometimes it can be easy to identify who is a language learner, but sometimes it's not easy. Um, and when I talked to our institutional research department, um, that was one of the things where um, we got it's we, our SUNY application for Farmingdale had 12% of students who reported that English was not their native language, but that could mean many things. I mean, I have some very close friends who English is not their native language, but it doesn't impact their, their writing or their communication. Um, so I think one of the tricky things, particularly about Generation 1.5, is that there's not that much data, these students are tracked in their ENL programs in K through 12. Um, once they leave that ENL program, um, maybe they're in college, the, the professors might not know who is a language learner. Um, but that's why I like that many of these strategies can be just implemented in general. So it doesn't matter who's a language learner or not, it will benefit them anyway. I hope that answered your question. Oh, every time I pop on the computer, somebody else asks the question. So I'm just gonna fade okay. back. Um, there's a question. How have you trained yourself to skip using idioms? 
I haven't. I guess that um, maybe I will just try to be very mindful of it because even I wanted to say like to make sure we're all on the same page. And I, I feel like it can be um, difficult to realize the language that you're using might not be clear. Um, and as you're speaking, like if you're teaching, sometimes it's a lot of talking, like it depends, um, but you might, and I'm trying to be mindful of it now. Um, yes, and so when I was doing this research, I was like, hmm, I should look up what an idiom is. <laughs> um, so I did that. Um, yes, it is difficult. All right, I'll like slowly pop up again. Just give people one more minute to, you know, if they have any other questions, but so if that happens, we'll go to them. But in the meantime, I just want to say thank you. Thank you so much. This was, this was great. And thanks for, um, you know, trying out the, the static slide and, and audio. Uh, if anybody liked it, um, or if you didn't like it, or just tell us what you thought in the evaluations. Um, you know, Caitlin, Caitlin has put the link to the evaluations. And also just want to give everybody a reminder to grab the link to the CE and CTLE certificates. Um, yeah, they're just, you have to send to scroll up in the chat to find uh, the, uh, the links that Caitlin put in there a few minutes ago. Um, and um, yeah, so I'm um, just looking, sorry, I got distracted by the chat and the can of corn is Lucy's favorite baseball mm. idiom, which, um, is something. Um, all right, so this is the conclusion of our programming for today, uh, day two of pillars. We will start up again with presentations at 10 o'clock tomorrow morning. And at um, 9.30, um, there will be uh, an art therapy program that will get us all warmed up for the day. So uh, thank you all for being here today. Um, it's great to see you and we will see you all tomorrow. Thank you. Kayla, do you want to stop recording? So we can... Okay, wait, are we still? Oh.